Hello, and welcome to Killer Score, the podcast that covers cult classic films with killer soundtracks and composers that we believe deserve more attention. This totally isn't like multiple takes that we've had of this, and I got it on the first try. Featuring a uh, special guest, the new kitten Zelda, who is just exploring this, uh, the dingy murder basement, and just having oh, she the, found a bug. just having time of her life. She just ate it. Oh yeah, good job, girl. Yep. Uh, my typical studio for voiceovers and this podcast has a little stowaway in it. That being our new kitten Zelda, and uh. She is very keen on the concept of exploring this place. Yeah, uh, you know, I, Aaron left to grab something briefly, and I was like, hey, do you, are you the new co-host? Because she hopped up on the chair, and after I asked, asked her that, she hopped down. I think she couldn't handle the responsibility, which is understandable. Anyway, uh, I am your host, creator of the podcast, Dalton Morrison. Uh, you can find me on all sorts of platforms under the tag Sick Jacket Man. You can find me on uh, Twitter and YouTube under that. And under and on Instagram, you can actually find me as well under just my normal name, Dalton Morrison. Um, yeah, audio projects I've been working on. Video scripts are in the pipeline. I need to start filming some stuff soon, which I will. Uh, I will hand it off to the others. And that was a Blu-ray. I'll cut that. Okay. Zelda's gonna read this off the box. Yeah, meow, 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 meow. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name is Aaron Murray. You can find me online under Naya Murray and WitchingCraftsNJ.com. Also, WitchingCrafts.NJ on Instagram. Um, I'm gonna be doing some projects in the near future. I haven't set up that YouTube account yet. It's probably gonna be under my Exploding Burrito Productions handle. Sorry, kitten. Um, and yeah, that's my spiel. <laughs> Your turn. Richard Eckert with Richie's Rad Voices and all sorts of collaborative efforts from Tantalus Productions and the Royal Everwest. Voice actor, media producer, and... Amateur at all three of those things. Uh, lots of new projects on the horizon, however, including some uh, audio dramas featuring contributions from these fine folks and my voiceover friends over at Everwest. Uh, mm -hmm. And on my own channel, just Richard Eckert, just look up Richard Eckert VA on either Twitter or YouTube you will see my latest collaboration in the form of a comic dub compilation for Brutus and Pixie. You know, Pixie and Brutus, featuring me and my dear buddy Ray Harrell as Pixie. She did an amazing job, and I'm super proud of the editing and acting work from myself as well. Go check that out on my own channel, and check out her stuff, too. Her Twitter link is in the description of that video. Yep, so uh, we're finally back after our little break. We went uh, to a convention at uh, Too Many Games, had a little break there. We weren't selling or doing anything. We were just perusing. Uh, Having fun. Yeah, hopefully some of you who subscribed to the channel after you were there are checking this out for our first uh, video Going back, uh, you know, we're going into the summer months now, and we're covering some uh, different things, and Aaron's bringing us into it. Yes, so um, I gave a little teaser at the end of the last episode, and now that we're out of Anna June, <laughs> <laughs> um, we are back at doing any movie we feel like. So I did, I decided that I was going to do a little comedy film that's a parody of the epic film genre done by the genius of Mel Brooks. Hey. Yay. Yay. This will be our first time covering Mel Brooks. Yes. And the interesting thing about this movie is that, um, we're, well, we're doing History of the World Part 1. The interesting thing about History of the World Part 1 is that he, is that Mel Brooks before this had banger after banger after banger of films 
this is the movie that did not do well. The first of his flops. The first of his flops. I still think this movie's hilarious. Um, well, not entirely true, because I'm pretty sure Young Frankenstein didn't do very well. I don't... No, no that oh, did well. Sorry. She was eating insulation. I'll cut that out. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. She she seems to have, like... Realized it doesn't taste good? Yeah. It's a learning experience. <laughs> it's a learning experience beating insulation. Hey, uh, idea. Oh, Maybe I should doing, alter the again. logo. I might alter the logo for this episode. Yeah. And uh, just put up a little kitty score logo. <laughs> just have her face in the K. Do, do not climb the... Sorry. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you guys are being amused by our distractions from a kitty doing this. But anyway, uh, yeah. Um, when it comes to this film, uh, I do know Mel Brooks's stuff. I'm not as intimately familiar with it as some other people have. I've only seen, like, a couple of his flicks, actually. I've only seen, like, Young Frankenstein and Spaceballs in their entirety. And, yeah. Uh, I've seen a bit of a uh, silent movie. Okay. Good movie. Yeah. Uh, I have been following Mel Brooks's filmography ever since, I want to say since I was eight, which, you know, funny age. To... I got to be... <laughs> silent movie was a flop, actually. It was, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. Um, But my, both my dads, yeah, my dad and my stepdad mm -hmm. were both really into... uh. Mel Brooks movies. I saw Young Frankenstein thanks to my grandfather and my, you know, my my dad. And I was introduced to Spaceballs by my stepdad because I was really, really, really into Star Wars in my youth. And that was probably my first real parody movie that oh, wow. I had seen. Uh, Good introduction, because Spaceballs, it's not as witty or as intricately constructed as, say, Young Frankenstein or Blazing Saddles, mm -hmm. but I'll be honest, it made me laugh more than any of his movies. Yeah, I think my first, like, real parody parody movie I saw was probably either Scary Movie or Airplane. See, for me, I saw Robin Hood Men in Tights when I was six years old. Again, good age to be seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did. There was one joke that didn't fly over my head, which was like, "All toilets will now be called Johns." <laughs> <laughs> uh, so many corny yet hilarious visual puns going on in Spaceballs too, from ludicrous speed to combing the desert. One of my favorite. Jokes. To the entire Michael Winslow bit. Where he does the sound effects yeah. for the radar being jammed. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and watch P Police Academy. Not necessarily because it's the best movie ever, but just for Michael Winslow. Just watch the first one. Yeah, just, just watch, watch the, the first, first one. one. For Michael Winslow specifically. Yeah. You yeah. don't need to go to Police Academy 7 Soviet shenanigans or whatever the fuck it's called. <laughs> Maybe I ought to get art for that. Anyway. Aaron. There is one where they go to the Soviet Union, I know, though. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, anyway, we are doing History of the World Part 1. This is an interesting backstory behind this movie. So, the score is done by John Morris, who you may know as being the a frequent composer with Mel Brooks huh? and Gene Wilder films, as well as being the composer for The Elephant Man. Oh! Yeah. Okay. He did uh, some of the music and the producers, oh, along okay. with Mel Brooks. It was like a collaboration they did. The original Zero Mistel. The original Mistel. Zero Mistel and Gene yeah. Wilder. And so this is a kind of, it, it was kind of a rush production because someone asked Mel Brooks in like a parking lot. It was like, hey, Mel, what's going to be your next big movie? And he said, History of the World. And they were like, you can't do all that in one movie. And he said, part one. And that's and that was the joke of creating the movie. Interestingly enough, however, 
Despite its title, History of the World Part 1 was never meant to be part one of a series, and was actually an homage to a documentary, I believe. Um, actually, no, not a documentary, a play called History of the World, which by uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, yeah. which was published in several volumes, but only ever saw to the completion of the first. Yeah. And the idea, that's how the idea came to Brooks, was some guy yelling in a parking lot and also Sir Walter Raleigh. Anyway, so Orson Welles was in this movie. Mm-hmm. He narrated all of... He narrated the scenes and the scene transitions and all that. It's funny, because they hired him for five days, and he did the entire thing in a couple hours. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Orson Welles. He was, the, so he was like, I got paid for five days, so I'm going to just do this all in three hours and collect a paycheck. Get me a jury and show me how you can do one part of History of the World, and I'll go down on you. <laughs> okay, then. Look it up. So, this movie was critically panned when it came out. Because when it came out, the only person who... The only reviewer that actually thought it was somewhat funny was Roger Ebert, who gave it, like, two stars. I thought Gene Siskel liked it as well. He gave it two stars. So they both were like... Eh, it was like, eh, it's alright. What the hell? That cat is a ball of energy. Yeah. Yeah, she just tried, tried to climb a door. Yeah. It the was... door to the studio. Yeah. Um, and also it was commercial failure. It came out the same week as Raiders Lost Ark. Oh, yeah. I've heard about that. And it came out also as Clash of the Titans and Cheech and Chong's Nice Dreams. I just realized this isn't the first time Indiana Jones has killed a comedy movie at the box office. Oh, what was the other one? When Last Crusade came out, you know what else came out along with it? What? UHF. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Movie. Which, if you guys haven't seen UHF, go watch that. It is classic comedy. Like, it, it's aged really well. It has, yeah. Some of the jokes in this film, I will admit, have not aged well. Um, that's kind of an over re overlapping problem with some of the Mel Brooks filmography that some of the jokes are just like, Nye. yeah, there's even, a, there's even a thing on the back of the DVD box that says there's a joke in here, a little, a little something, something to, to offend, offend everyone. everyone. Yeah. So it's kind of, yeah, it's Mel Brooks shtick. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing with Mel Brooks's comedy is that he has admitted in interviews that his ethos on it is throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. And this has led to, you know, hit or miss stuff. Go back and listen to his commentary on Spaceballs, and there are some jokes that he kind of rolls his eyes at. Like, be they because they're tasteless or because he thought they were corny in hindsight. You know, it's funny. Uh, using my own uh, anecdotes, I actually, um, I, I knew, uh, I actually knew some black students in the theater department who would quote Spaceballs specifically. They would, they would quote the <laughs> "We found, found shit." shit. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, that visual gag with the one comb. The oh, fact God. that they have like the Afro pick comb. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's really it's... funny. It's simultaneously the funniest and most tasteless thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that that's the kind of the humor in it. Yeah, yeah, and like Mel Brooks did work with a lot of black writers, so yeah, Especially Richard Pryor worked on Blazing Saddles. Yeah. And Richard Pryor was supposed to be in this movie. And then until crack pipe. the crack pipe incident, he was freebasing and it exploded in his face. He was in the hospital for a while and they replaced him with Gregory Hines, who Honestly, Gregory Hines was a great pick. It was actually Madeline Kahn's um, suggestion to cast Gregory Hines because oh. they were friends. Yeah, it's funny. Um, when I think of comedy, I, like I think the reason Weird Al has hung on so long is because like uh, his humor is kind of timeless. Yeah. Because like Weird Al's comedy is so stupid, it's impossible to like be offended by his comedy. Yeah. <laughs> 
Like, just, for seriously. Just uh, getting a little behind-the-scenes yeah. footage for the inevitable moment when I put this footage out on the YouTube video version. Oh, yeah. Of is Ganon she just... She is on your ukulele. Yep, okay. just sitting on the ukulele grooming herself. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this one, I am the uninitiated. I believe Richie's already seen this one. No, actually, I have oh. not. Oh. I've seen bits and pieces of it, mostly through friends showing me clips and saying, hey, watch this shit if you like Mel Brooks. And I remember specifically this movie being featured under the free movies under Xfinity for a little bit mm -hmm. and saying, I'm going to watch that at some point and just never did for about 15 years. <laughs> I feel like we've all fallen into that. I recently had a similar thing where uh, for about the 10 years I've known a friend of mine, he's told me I need to play Portal 2. And I'm like, yeah, I'll play that. I just started playing that last week. <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, boy. Uh, Zelda? <laughs> no, no clawsies. to her attention more. <laughs> no clawsies. Just grab her. Get her. Get yep. the cat. Get yeah, the cat. Get you. This is amazing. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, the History of the World Part 1 featuring cats. Not not the <laughs> not the musical. Uh, anyway, uh, you got some more fun factoids? Yes, I do. So there is a scene that's set during Roman times. I, if you can't tell. That was the mixer. Okay, I think it's still working. Are we still okay, here? still recording. Okay, uh, there's a scene set in Roman times that they wanted to shoot at Caesar's Palace. Mm -hmm. Like they want, it was either we can build a set or we can shoot in Las Vegas. So they shot in Las Vegas. That's funny. Which cannot be cheap. No, they uh, they used it for a few shots in the film, but they didn't film the entirety of the Caesar's Palace scene in a casino. Because <laughs> that would just be ridiculous. So, if there are peculiar gaps in the audio for the final edited version of this, I want to let you know it is because Zelda has knocked over the mixer repeatedly and has gotten into mic range. And she's a little she she's a little attention fiend. She's a she's a kitten. Of course she is. Yeah. Yeah. It seems she has left the studio. However. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna close the door real quick. Yeah. Just so. Yeah. We... I'm gonna cut this out. I'm gonna. Oh cut no! It just out. you could have continued. Yeah. So, there is an unexpected cameo that you guys may notice later, or you may not. Who knows? Um, John Hurt's in this movie. Oh. And you're gonna laugh at who he plays. I am excited for this. I've only seen, like I said, I've seen clips here and there, mainly. Of the coming attractions towards a certain point in the movie. And also... She's climbing the door. She's, mad. she's climbing the door. Is she meowing? No, she just wants back in. Fine, come in. <gasps> <laughs> she's like, I want to be around people. See, this is going to be the best worst podcast episode ever. Yeah. So, uh, John Hurt, you guys are going to laugh when you hear this. Plays Jesus. Yes! <laughs> yes, he plays Jesus of Nazareth in this movie. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, hello. You know what the worst part of this episode is? What? I can only film so much of it behind the scenes. Yeah. Like, because... I won't be able to get the best shots of her just trampling around and climbing. Just put a camera in the corner, like there or there. <laughs> yeah. I brought my camera and put I should have. Next episode. Live Zelda reaction. Next episode. Oh, she's trying to open the door to get back out. Uh, she'll I'll, figure it yeah, out. She'll, she'll figure, figure it out. She she's like a velociraptor. Anyway. Um. Anyway. So. Clever girl. John Cleese was also going to be in this movie. But he was unavailable. They asked him to play um, a French count. Mm. Oh, that would have been amazing. That'd it would have been, been hilarious. Been However, 
he was busy. It, it was like 1980, and he was busy doing another project, I think, with Monty Python. Yeah. Wouldn't be surprised if that were Life of Brian, because that wasn't that 80. Might, wasn't that 90? Yeah, he might have been doing that, or he might have been working on uh, the Meaning of Life. Yeah, which is another movie we want to cover on I, here. I do, I do. Um, but yeah, let's. A lot of the rest of my notes on here, besides the sequel, History of the World Part Two, that came out on Hulu earlier this year. Um, that is a sketch comedy show. That is reportedly not bad. I've seen mixed reviews. There's people I know who are like, oh, that's really funny. And people I know who are like, why am I watching this? I like the movie better. Well, yeah, it's pretty apropos for a sequel to this movie to be hit or miss, apparently. Yeah, I mean, it's a Mel Brooks movie that a lot of people consider hit or miss. So, <laughs> Yeah, he must have just been busy with other projects because Life of Brian came out like two years before this. Oh, oh. okay. And, uh... Meaning of Life didn't come out for another few years. Yeah, and there's one more thing I wanted to mention. Yes? On the topic of Mel Brooks throwing jokes at a wall and seeing what sticks, um, yeah, there was a joke that was that was in the original cut, but they had to cut out of the film entirely, like an entire scene of the movie. An entire scene? Yeah. It was... A joke about the Three Mile Island incident. Oh. And people were la- people didn't laugh in the pre-screening, so it was like, okay, back to the editing room. Back to the cutting room. Back to the cutting room. Because this did not uh, go well. <laughs> well, on I that- can imagine why. On that happy note, uh, yeah. mind if I uh, do a yeah, little go ahead, go ahead. reading of the back of the box? Please. <clears throat> a little something to offend everyone. Mel Brooks' uproarious version of history proves nothing is sacred as he takes us on a high, laugh-filled look at what really happened throughout time. His delirious romp features everything from a wild send-up of 2001 to the real stories behind the Roman Empire. Brooks portrays a stand-up philosopher at Caesar's Palace. The French Revolution, Brooks reigns as King Louis XVI and the Spanish Inquisition, a splashy song and dance number with monks and swin... Aiming nuns. It's Mel and company at their hilarious best. Which is kind of a misnomer, because <laughs> Mel and company at their hilarious best would be you young Frankenstein and Blazing Saddles, but this is still a really funny movie. Blue Hawk! <laughs> Somebody's gotta go back and get a shitload of dimes. So, uh, that's a reminder to editing Richie to add a horse sound effect in post. Anyway. And you completely butchered the name, too. Yeah. Blucher. Blucher? Yeah. Blucher. Don's a good person to learn German from. Thank you. Yes, yes, he is. Don't chew on that. (laughs) Yeah, you're gonna have to get used to hearing that. Yeah. Yes, uh, until post-screening, I believe, which, uh... Aaron, do you have anything else before we begin? Um, not really. Uh, this movie is streaming on Hulu. You can watch it there if you want, if you're interested. Uh, you can also pick up DVD copies pretty cheap. Um, I don't know if there was a Blu-ray release. There probably was, but I got a DVD copy of Barnes and Noble for eight bucks. So. Yep. Anyway, we will see you after the screening. Yep. And we're back. We just finished watching History of the World Part 1 here on Killer Score. And I want to know, what do you guys think? Who wants to go first? Uh, Richie's grabbing the mic, so I guess he's going first. Yeah, Dalton seems like he's uh, verbalizing his thoughts soon. Yeah, anyway. I'll take it back. <laughs> yep. Anyway, uh, much like Aaron said, this is neither Mel Brooks's worst movie not when uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It exists, and also not his best. This, true to the form of being basically a sketch comedy compilation about, you know, different parts of history, there are jokes that are hilarious and con- and constitute some of Mel Brooks's best recurring material. 
and others that just sort of flop. flop or just sort of fly right past you with not much of a reaction to give. Uh, I think the... M- I think the movie is at its best when it's taking pot shots at, you know, world leaders throughout history and doing that sort of social satire. But then uh, it kind of has to fight for room with some, I don't want to say sophomoric gags, but low tier. Yeah, I would say sophomoric. Yeah, sophomoric. Maybe that's the word. I mean, there's a fart joke. Yeah, Yeah, there is a fart joke. And some gross-out jokes, which never was Mel Brooks's no. strong suit. No. I mean, there's fart jokes and Blazing Saddles, but I doubt anyone thinks that's, like, the funniest scene in the movie. Absolutely yeah, the not. the scene where they're sitting around the campfire and farting, that's not the funniest scene in the movie. No. no. Absolutely uh, not. That. So this is my first time seeing it, and uh, it reminds me a lot of another movie that we're probably going to cover on the podcast eventually, and... I honestly think that that movie is this movie, but better. And I know that's like a, like a high bar, you know, it's Mel Brooks, you know, Mel Brooks, like everyone's like, ah, comedy legend, Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks. This feels like a lesser version of the meaning of life to me. Okay. Cause you know, it's, it's very, it's a very fragmented movie. With a that's mostly made of skits that like segues for, through a bunch of different area, eras in history that has one overarching theme. And this movie, it's the history of the world and the meaning of life. It's different stages of life and like life and death. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's more parallels as well. Meaning of life. It also has a big musical number like this one does. Yeah, this one has a big inquisition. Yeah, number. which I do like, but. It's not quite as catchy as every sperm is sacred. That's true. <laughs> um, and the end, of, like and the Spanish Inquisition, sketch like gag just kind of just kind of ends. Yeah, it, ju- it does just kind of end. Like there's no big punchline. The musical number just kind of ends. Just sort of stops. Whereas yeah. like after um, uh, after that, like uh, in Meaning of Life, there's the whole gag with the Catholics where it's like. We're Catholic, honey. We don't worry about sex. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's, that's that's fair. You know what this basically is? Um, for an American equivalent uh, of similar films, this is basically just a historical spin on the Kentucky Fried movie, but slightly funnier. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, that movie was about just different genre. Skits and stuff, yeah. Genre f- Film genres. Isn't the only thing people really remember from Kentucky Fried Movie the joke about the mud fight? Yes. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. The Zucker movies are weird in hindsight. Yeah. I mean, some of them are definitely better than others. Airplane's the big one. But people sleep on Top Secret. I haven't seen it. Neither have I. Oh. Oh, my God. It's so good. It's, it's Potential a great... episode? Oh, yeah. It's a great parody of all those... It's kind of like almost like an Indiana Jones kind of joke thing because it's a parody of old like film serials and stuff oh. like that. Uh, that movie has one of my favorite sight gags in the entire film. So, uh, you know that bit where like someone's like you know like having a passive conversation while they're painting and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you finally see what they're painting. Well, that scene's taking place on a train. Oh. And Val Kilmer's character is like looking out the window of the train and like painting the scenery. And then when it finally cuts to his, his painting, it's a bunch of blurry trees. Because <laughs> there's me by on the train. That's a good visual gag there. Uh, it, yeah. So many good visual gags. They do a saloon fight in that movie underwater <laughs> like they sink underwater and there's just an underwater saloon and while they're holding their breath they're like sliding people across the bar breaking bottles underwater it's it's a great gag so uh sometimes it gets away from us but let's talk about that score for this movie uh, yeah it's very good it's very good really, it's very good as far as comedy goes you can't get much better for grand operatic orchestral stuff honestly the scores remind me a lot of like the old uh like charlton heston religious epics 
That's what they were going for, uh, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like Ten Commandments, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Hur. Ben Hur. Uh, I'm sure there's some other big religious epic I'm forgetting about. I can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> Always when you I know, point the mic. To... Head is not related at all and not directed by Charlton Heston. <laughs> like every, you ever notice that any time I think Aaron's speaking, I put the mic towards yeah, her. And she's it's like, like not time, Richie, not time. Oops. She's like, not the right time. I'll grab the mic when I'm ready. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, we forgot to mention due to the aforementioned cat situation we have going on in the studio. No, we that... did mention it was composed by John Morris. She said that. Oh, no, no. I was going to talk about the fact that just a couple days ago, it's actually Mel Brooks's birthday. Oh, yeah. It was Mel Brooks's birthday a couple days ago. He's, He's like 90-something. 97. Though. He's 97 years old. <laughs> and still going. And still and still working too. Yeah, because I think he was he's, he's he was a supervising director on uh, History of the World Part Two, and I think he acts in it. So he does. Yeah, yeah, he makes some cameos. Yeah. Which honestly, I mean, a part two, not part one. I might, I might, like I know the TV show's mixed, but all I'm thinking about is yeah, this format feels like it works better for a TV show. I can see that. I can see that. As I said earlier, it's definitely not Mel Brooks' best movie. However, I still think some of the jokes land pretty well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know what this feels like a precursor to? What? what? Drunk History. Oh! oh yeah. yeah. I love that show. That show, show is very funny. Yeah, you get drunk people telling stories of history and how they keep fucking it up. The one the one with Superman and the KKK is one of the funniest things ever. <laughs> My favorite one is uh, Florence and Nightingale, because they're just like, this yeah. guy's dick is out. <laughs> oh, oh, or the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. one. Yeah. That one's a legendary one. Um, yeah, no, uh... Yeah, Dom DeLuise was fun. I, admittedly, I, I think the Caesar's Palace gag is cute. Um, probably my favorite thing in the entire movie is B. Arthur, though. It's oh, B. Yeah. Arthur. She's a legend. She steals every scene uh, she's in. I'm gay. So, you know, I like, I'm a very queer person. So, of course, when B. Arthur is on screen, I'm like, yes, please. Yes, thank please. you. Madeline Kahn was the highlight for me as the Empress in the Ancient Rome segment. Empress Nympho. Yeah. Yep. That's the name they went with, was Empress Nympho. Just this uh, s- silver vixen type who's clearly done with everyone's shit and yeah. clearly yeah. drunk. Madeline Kahn was, was a versatile actress, but for my money, her best characters are the snobby... Uh, snooty types that end up at the butt of different jokes. See also Young Frankenstein. Yeah. Yes. Um, Did you see her as, uh, what's her name in Young Frankenstein? I'm blanking on it. Maria, isn't it? Wasn't it just Marie? No, it was Maria. Anyway, Richie, look it up. And as Lillian von Stupp yes. in Blazing Saddles. Anyway. So, I think the score really stands out in this movie. Um, what are some of your guys... Actually, I was going to say favorite scenes. It was Elizabeth, by the way. That was Elizabeth, it. that's what it was. Sorry, I'm padding. <laughs> anyway, uh, scenes and score, I guess. See, I was going to say scenes and jokes. Okay. But Dalton already mentioned yeah, the, Arthur, if there is the unemployment, unemployment agent... Off. Yeah, the gla- both with the gladiator and the stand-up philosopher, like, okay, but if you don't kill someone soon, you know, that, you're that's gonna lose a- your benefits. You're gonna lose your benefits, and uh, also, um, you know, oh, a bullshit artist. Did you bullshit last, last week? week? Did you try to bullshit? bullshit last week? Yeah. Um, my favorite gags, uh, or at least favorite uh, actor, would probably have to be based. Basically, any joke or scene involving Gregory Hines. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, obviously, Richard Pryor would have been a hell of a win for this movie, but he still has that same energy. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, no. Oh, my. 
Okay, we're good. We're still recording. We're somehow no. still we're recording. recording. You guys are the cat walked across the laptop. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, you guys can Holy... see. Holy. Oh my god. It's still intact. Okay, please go. Please, please. <laughs> She's gonna climb the door. You realize that, right? Well. What? What choice do we have? <laughs> She's what just choice? looking up at you, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> She's gonna climb the door in a minute. Oh, come on, let me in. I'll for for context, the cat found her way to the laptop desk, also known as my recording apparatus, <laughs> and climbed across She's the keyboard. She meowed at me like, come on. Uh, fine. I believe that she kittens. You know that, right? <laughs> We have basically no choice but to keep the mic running on this segment, just so you know. <laughs> now she wants the door open. What do you want? She's a cat. She doesn't know. <laughs> do you like me or not? I can't even tell. <laughs> History of the World the Part out? 1. <laughs> I think she likes me still. She likes you. She just wants the door kept open. Yeah, she's just a very particular cat. Um, History of the World Part 1. Anyway, uh, Gregory Hines Gregory was... Gregory is great in this movie. He's great. I love Gregory Hines. He has, just about anything. He has my favorite line delivery in the movie, too, frankly, where uh, he and uh, the stand-up philosopher are forced to fight, and uh, he spares him. He's like, that's the closest I've ever come to let... I get a white person. Or, no, 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 it's... You're the first white person I've come close to liking. Yeah. And you can tell that there's that same Richard Pryor spirit behind it, and it's yeah. great. I, I thought he was okay. I'll I'll be honest, I, d- I didn't think his performance was particularly interesting. What was that energy, though? I didn't see it, to be honest. Oh. He felt just kind of... He just felt kind of passive to me, like... I feel, I think my biggest problem with this movie is Mel Brooks doesn't feel particularly cooperative in this movie to me. It feels like he's like controlling all of the scenes and taking all of the screen time and not really letting the other people shine. Mm -hmm. There's like, there's like one scene in this movie he's not involved in. Yeah. And that's, the, like, the French Revolution scene where they're in the bar, right? Well, actually, there's, like, only, like, two or three scenes. There's, like, the caveman stuff at the beginning because he's, not, cause he's not in that. And also the bit with the Empress. Memo. Yeah. Of course, Leechman, too, in yeah. the French yeah, Revolution. The, yeah. The bar and the course Leechman. Those are, like, the only three scenes he's not involved in. And, like, I love Mel Brooks, but in my opinion, he's best behind the camera and doing small bits and landing punchlines and stuff like that like he's not a leading man yeah i mean mel brooks never looked like a leading man to begin with yeah but even in comedy to me he's best as a writer and like a director i'll tell you what it is and thank you for helping me click with this he is no gene wilder no, no, he is no, not. He no, not Gene no. Because even comedies have leading yeah. men. He's he's like a Terry Gilliam. Yeah. Yeah. Like Terry Gilliam is good when he's in Monty Python sketches. Mm-hmm. But there's a reason he was known for the lead Python. Yeah. There's the reason he didn't lead the films. Yeah. And that Graham Chapman led the films. Yeah. Him Chapman and John Cleese. Yeah. And. Uh, Terry Jones. Yeah. Yes, because like Michael Palin. Michael Palin. Michael Palin. Yeah. Yeah. I like. I, I I like Mel Brooks' stuff, but I feel like you know, I look at other historical comedies in a similar vein, particularly the Python stuff, and I just think it's better. I fo- like, for example, another historical film, Life of Brian. I, yeah. Life of Brian way funnier to me than this one was you know now i think about it i can't agree because the last third of this movie just keeps missing yeah 
Well, Life of Brian gets funnier and funnier throughout the movie. Not and, that it's fun. And on rewatch. And on rewatch. Like, there, that movie I quote all the time, you know, the, yeah, you're all individuals. We're all individuals. I'm not. Shh. <laughs> like, you, you know, he's saying, what is he saying? Blessed are the cheese makers? <laughs> What's so special about them? <laughs> you know, like. I still need to. I have held off of watching that because that is an episode oh, that yeah. he has I, had. I will, I will absolutely. Be That's an episode that, that he's had in the back catalog for a while. Yeah, a lot of the jokes just feel kind of forced, forced and lazy in this to me. A little like, bit. Like yeah. a lot of the jokes, it, it feels like the most obvious joke they could have gone with. You know, mm-hmm. like ha ha ha, all of these, because like. Look at these Roman names. Yeah, or oh, look at that! All of these, uh, uh, like the the emperor is fat and lazy and farts and burps a lot, and it's like, did a fourteen year old write this? Like, yeah, I think that's what like it's more demonstrative of like Mel Brooks's weakness as a comedian, in that. The whole scattershot approach means you're going to have a lot of misses. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. Um, oh, let me fix this. Okay. We're good. Okay, just want to make sure. Um, yeah, I can definitely see this. As, like, this is one of his weaker movies. I wouldn't put it on the same level as Dracula Dead and Loving It. Cause Obviously not, because that movie blows. That is just a really bad movie. I'll take your word for it. I haven't seen it. But, uh. You are not missing anything. Usually if you would think, oh, Leslie Nielsen's working with Mel Brooks. That's going to be great. And then you see Leslie Nielsen as Dracula. And yeah. you're just very confused. Confused and kind of sad. Yeah. Because this is what's, when... What's sad, though? You want to know what's really sad, though? This is the late 90s, too. Yeah. You want to know what's really sad, though? What? what? I've still heard more about Dracula Dead and Loving It than I've heard about History of the World. Wow. I'm surprised. This is this is a movie that just kind of gets buried. Yeah. Yeah, I can kind of see that. What the f- Cuz with like Dracula Dead and Loving It, people are like, "Oh my god, that movie is so bad." Or in more commonly more recent years I've been hearing people say you know, people are too harsh on that movie. There's some good gags and bits it's, in it. They're kind of buried, though. It's kind of like Dracula Den loving it, uh, probably never covering it. So I'll just say that it's got Leslie Nielsen doing his best and a couple of good gags buried beneath a bunch of zeitgeist gags at the time. Mm-hmm. That was basically Mel Brooks saying, I'm trying to be hip and failing. Please save me. That was Zelda's input, apparently. Yeah, uh, she didn't like that movie either. Okay. She she literally jumped up to Mike level there. Yeah. I, like, I literally heard her go... Rawr. Yeah, she had her opinions on this. I'm really sorry that I didn't like this as much as you guys. It's, it's okay. It was okay. I mean, I haven't watched this movie since I was probably 19 or 20. Yeah. And I forgot how bad the last third of it is. Aaron, if it's any consolation... You can rest assured knowing that you didn't have the biggest disappointment in the last couple of episodes. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I, I just thought it was kind of like, eh. It was mid-tier. Yeah. Mid-tier for Mel Brooks. And some of the stuff just like, I keep expecting there to be a joke. And like, there really isn't. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, like. Kind of a joke by association type thing. Yeah. Uh, The only other thing I do really enjoy, I will say, obviously the ending with the coming attractions, those are all great. Jews in space, everyone loves that. Hitler on ice. Hitler on ice. And uh, earlier in the film, I do love the Last Supper scene. Oh, yeah, the Last Supper scene is hilarious. That's really funny. John... John Hurt, I wish he had done comedy more because he was really good. At oh, he was awesome. Fantastic straight man. Yeah, that's one of the things I do love about this movie is John Hurt. And he took on the role because he had done so many dramatic roles before that that he just wanted to do something funny. Yeah. 
So he was like, yeah, I'll do a Mel Brooks movie. So stone-faced and dignified as Jesus. And it plays off perfectly off of uh, Mel Brooks's screwball shtick. Um, oh, and just bring up notes. Don't worry. Am yeah. I a... And ending aside, I really do like the Inquisition musical number. Yeah, it's fun. I, it's fun. I do like how much effort they put into it. With the synchronized swimming nuns. From the synchronized swimming nuns to the sparkler holding human candles on, on a menorah. Yeah, which you can tell they did with reverse photography. Yeah, because there's no way you can do that. Normal. With sparklers in water. Because they wouldn't light if you put them in water and then went out, you know? No, they wouldn't. Um, There was just one thing I wanted to mention sure. that I was holding off until after we watched it mm-hmm. was... um, Sorry, you don't have to keep moving the mic. I mentioned this in the screening, but I didn't mention this in the podcast. The uh-huh. Vestal Virgins are played by Playboy Bunnies back yeah. in the 70s, and Hugh Hefner actually has a line in this movie, which is, like, one of those things that was funny back then, but now you're like, Ugh. I feel gross. Mm. <laughs> this episode on Killer Shore, everyone takes showers with hydrochloric acid. Yes. Yeah. Uh. But, yeah, like... Like Dalton said earlier, like, I do love Mel Brooks when he does act, but the thing that he recognized in his other movies is that he's a guy that you need to use sparingly. Yeah. Not such a strength. Not This is not so with this movie where he's the leading man in every segment. Like, he's best when he's villains, honestly. Yeah. When he's laughable villains like uh, President Scroob from... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, space hey, that's balls. my combination, you know. But mm-hmm. yeah, with the, or the that luggage gag is so amazing. Yeah, yeah. Or that landowner guy in Blazing Saddles. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, work, 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 work. Hello, boys. I missed you. <laughs> uh, that one line that he has in Space Balls, where he's like, "I don't know how to make decisions. I'm a president." Which is like. It's funny, and it's true. Well, obviously. (laughs) Isn't that the fun of it? Yeah, it's funny, because it's true. Like, he obviously is a genius, but yet, Dalton Dalton said it best when he mentioned he is the Terry Gilliam of his troupe. Yeah, because, and the thing, because I agree that Mel Brooks works best sparingly. And he works better behind the camera than in front. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is outside of Madeline Kahn, there weren't a ton of Mel Brooks regulars in this movie. Harvey Corman. I mean, besides Madeline Kahn and Harvey Corman. Yeah. I think that's kind of at the movie's fault. Uh, maybe not the right word. It's a flaw. Flaw. It's at the movie. It's a flaw in the movie, because I feel like if Gene Wilder had been in this, it would have been a lot funnier. Yes. Could yes. you imagine him as, say, the Emperor? Oh yeah, no. Yeah. Emperor, or if he was even, just, if he was, uh, you know, the Louis Sixteenth Ro- or something, or the, or the Roman guy, the Duke, the, or the the stand-up philosopher, the Duke yeah. de, Mon- de Money, Comicus. Com- yeah, he would have been great as Comicus. Like, yeah. it just feels like this was missing like that extra little spice. It was missing that oomph. Yeah, it was missing the, it was missing the satirical edge of Blazing Saddles or the stylistic commitment of Young Frankenstein, Young Frankenstein or the or spectacle. Silent movie. Oh, the stylistic commitment of Silent Movie yeah. or the spectacle. Of Spaceballs. Yeah. Because I know I brought up Spaceballs a lot, but I bring it up purposefully because as good as the score is at conveying the whole biblical epic tone, it feels kind of half-assed when you compare it to, say, Spaceballs, which spared no expense oh, on the yeah. special effects or the sound effects 
or the set design. Yeah, and it goes to show you, you don't need a movie with Mel Brooks regulars to be funny, because Spaceballs does not have a lot of Mel Brooks regulars. No, it doesn't. It's like, literally, I'm tr- I'm struggling to think of a Mel Brooks regular in that movie. John Candy was in one other movie of his, and it was a bit part before he became Barf. Yeah, and like everyone else is like pretty much newer like actors yeah. or stuff, and with the exception of um, Mel Brooks. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, who's the guy from Little Shop of Horrors? Rick, Rick Moranis. Moranis. Rick Moranis. What was he in? I thought he was in Spaceballs. We're talking about other movies. Oh, other movies. Sorry. Uh, Mel Brooks movies. No, he was only in Spaceballs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bill Pullman too was who surprisingly I'm... good at comedy. Oh yeah, criminally underrated. By the way, yeah. he deserved. Uh, I guarantee you that. Uh, I don't want to jinx it or anything, but I guarantee you that once, you know, he passed. Passes. Mm-hmm. He's going to get that legacy that he was, you know, kind of wrongfully bereft He's underrated. Of. He's underrated. He's underrated. And I implore all of you to at least go see Serpent and the Rainbow. And he can take movies that aren't that interesting and make them more interesting. Case in point, Lost Highway. Yeah. I wouldn't go so far as to say that's not that interesting of a movie. It's David Lynch. It's one of his weaker efforts, though, and he agrees with me. It's still David Lynch, though, you know? Still. Every director has their kind of He's kind of like Bill Paxton to me, where he could just take material and elevate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Although everyone gets them confused. They do. They do. Because, like, you know what? You know what's a movie that's kind of like, meh, but Bill Paxton really elevates it to me? Twister. Oh, yeah. Honestly... Um. Yeah, th- that would have been a nothing movie without him. One of the better disaster movies, I would argue, though. One of them. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. What are your guys' opinions on disaster movies? I think when they're done well, they can be impactful. Oh yeah. When they're done poorly, they're garbage. When they're done poorly, there's something like 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Um. John Cusack is in that movie. Yeah, what's that really famous one with the day the... after tomorrow? No, uh, with the boat. A lot of Roland Emmerich movies we're bringing up. Um, the one the one, with, one the... with the boat from the seventies. Not Das Boot. No. No, that's a submarine. It's like a big cruise liner, and it like gets turned upside down or some shit like that. I know yeah, they did like a remake of it. There's a parody of it on The Simpsons. Hmm. Oh man, and this is gonna kill me because that movie's actually like a really famous one. Um. Oh, Towering Inferno is another famous one. You know. Yeah. Do you consider Armageddon one? Yeah, you know, disaster movie. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. That movie's dumb, but I love it. Poseidon Adventure. Ah. Poseidon Adventure. The Poseidon Adventure, yep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the one. That's the song. That's the one with the song, that that morning after song. Yeah, and that's that's the one that, I, like, a lot of people credit with, like, kicking off, like, a lot of disaster Absolutely. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like, it, it's like a precursor to a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this one, it's cute, but, like, there's nothing... There wasn't like not substantial. No, yeah. There's not like a killing me with laughter moment. Like, there's nothing like there's not a single thing in this that this is gonna sound harsh, but the strongest jokes is in this aren't as funny as the weakest joke in Young Frankenstein. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm with you on that. There's I also mentioned it was a rush production. Yeah. 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 And, and you can like... kinda tell just by the set design and yeah it feels like it, it kind of feels like everyone just kind of wants to get the movie done yeah yeah um and then work on something else soon like there's a like every mel brooks mo- movie you can name something that makes you laugh out loud like madeline khan singing sweet mystery of life yeah. or <laughs> or the candy gram for mr mongo yeah uh or Basically, any moment Rick Moranis is on screen in Spaceballs. 
I cracked up every time in uh, Young Frankenstein they did jokes with the inspector's fake hand. It oh, yeah, yeah, the squeaking. Yeah. And, again, the, uh, what's her name? The old lady. Say it because you know the German. Frau Bucher. <laughs> Blucher. Yeah. Every moment of that is so well-timed, and it always... Like, they do it differently every time, too, and oh that's the God. genius the, of it. I feel bad for forgetting his name, but the guy who plays Igor kills Marty him Feldman. Marty Feldman. Marty Feldman. Oh, my God. That's what this movie could have used, was some Marty Feldman. Like, oh, yeah. He was great in silent movie, too. Oh, yeah. He's great in everything. Oh, yeah. Um, That would, uh... Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but... That moment where he just says Blucher's name and just smiles at the camera yeah, as, he, as, the, the, horses, as yeah. the horses freak out. Yeah, or, you know, the, I ain't got nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Classics. Or the fact that he actually was the one who came up with the hump gag. And it w- they just kind of rolled with it because he would move it. And, like, it literally actually legitimately caught Gene Wilder off. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are the best moments. Yeah. But, yeah. Um... Also, another uh, another Mel Brooks production that we are not talking about. I don't know why we're not talking about it, because it's fantastic. The Producers. Yeah. Oh. It doesn't, it doesn't, That that's what I'm looking for, the word I'm looking for. It doesn't feel as natural as his other films. Yeah. No. Like, a lot of it, even the, like, the big gags in his other movies, they feel a lot more natural. They don't feel like forced, forced or phoned in, you know? Because, you know what? I can get the sense sort of, like, segment to segment, I could kind of feel Mel Brooks going, okay, all right, we got to really put this one together. There's a lot of moving parts to this. Yeah. And that's not his best strength. No. Mel Brooks is a guy whose gags hit you where you least expect it and when you least expect it, which coincidentally is something that works about stuff that he wrote for TV skits. Like, he's, uh, look he's, at... He's a great collaborator. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look at, look at Get Smart. And this, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of collaboration done in this. It does very much feel like he's kind of taking an auteur mm-hmm. approach to that, which, again, that's not his strength. It's building his... It, it's it's using his ideas as blocks on to build upon other people's foundations. Yeah, or, like, look at the producers, like Aaron mentioned. That feels like everyone's working together on the jokes. Oh, absolutely. Because they literally were, too. Yeah. Like, you had, you know, Gene Wilder working off Zero Mostel, vice versa, and everyone just, like, kind of collaborating on that movie. Mm -hmm. This feels more like Mel Brooks going, okay, do this joke. That's going to be really funny. Yeah, absolutely. very much throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Because it, like, every joke in here feels like a Mel Brooks joke to me. Whereas in something like, say, Spaceballs, it feels like, oh, yeah, that was probably a Rick Moranis joke right there. Yeah. Or, oh, that's classic John Candy. I bet that was John Candy. Or right? hell, with Young Frankenstein, all those clear moments of improv from Madeline Kahn. Or Gene Wilder, for that matter, yeah. you know? Yeah. I feel like this is going to sound really strange, but if there's one thing about Gene Wilder that I love, it's his scream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because I've seen him in a bunch of movies, and when he, like, starts freaking out and screaming, it is amazing. It's yeah. always amazing. Like, I'm thinking of stuff like, um, uh, you know, even his some of Gene Wilder's weaker stuff that, like, he wasn't involved with with Out Mel Brooks. I kind of enjoyed more more than this. Like, uh, Richie, have you seen See No Evil, Hear No Evil? Heard of it, never seen it. That's a fun one. Gene Wilder, Richard Pryor. Oh, wow. Uh, one's blind, the other's deaf. <laughs> and they, like, end up getting embroiled in, like, a crime. And they have to work together to, like, clear their name, basically. Yep. Uh, oh, get her off it. Yep. Oh, no. Oh, no. Safe. Okay, we're still good. 
that'll be a little visual gag for all you out here. She is all yeah. she's a little chaos gremlin. <laughs> I got all of that. Okay. Uh <laughs> Before uh, before the set gets destroyed, we're closing up on our time as we usually get yeah, done with. Um, uh, we're at just under an yeah, hour. Yeah, I. Seconds. We I, could segue into the next one. I'd say. Yeah, I, I mean, does anyone have anything else to put in, or Aaron, do you want to close us out with anything? Or? Watch, uh, um, watch, watch spaceballs. <laughs> watch, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, and the producers. That's, and silent movie. Yeah, I mean, Silent Movie has arguably one of the funniest jokes in, Mar- in Mel Brooks's entire career, the the Marcel Marceau joke, which is go go watch the movie. It's honestly one of the funniest jokes Mel Brooks ever came up with. That being said, Aaron, it seems that the movie ball naturally passes to our beloved host. So we recently uh, left and went to a convention. You know, we were on the road, and for for those of you who are unaware, we all live in America here. Uh, we're we're all American citizens, born and raised, and few things represent America more than driving across country, going on big road trips. Like it's one of the things we're well known for, and no business represents ro- the roads and American culture quite as much as McDonald's. So, for our next movie, have you ever been curious about how McDonald's became a franchise? How did it go from being a little burger stand out in California to turning into this massive multi-billion dollar fran- like franchise corporation that exists Almost every country on the world in the world. Well, you can see a little bit about that as Michael Keaton plays the founder of the McDonald's franchise, Ray Kroc, in our next episode, The Founder.